archives really are the memory of an institution. The keepers of the memories. And when you think how important memories are even just in your own families, The legacy and the and the mission. How does that mission continue in this day and age? We want that to be kept. I think one of the phrases that means so much to me is that the person in front of you, without a doubt, is really God in front of you. So how do you serve that person? How do you care for that person? So in all things charity, our life is geared towards loving God and loving our neighbor. That's the charism of the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine. I was actually a pharmacy technician for two years. I was still in high school. It was a job that I had while being in high school. And uh, so I went to high school and then that, at night I'd come and work in the pharmacy at St. Vincent's. The sister that I worked with who was director of pharmacy, Sister Muriel, uh, she and I locked up the pharmacy. And in doing that, there were two doors and you could see them today at the hospital. We would probably which would have taken us five minutes to conclude. We did in probably 20 minutes, because we shared at that time about what religious life was about and uh, my own personal story and how uh, I might be attracted to religious life. We uh, got in the car, left Lakewood, and went to St. Vincent Charity, picked up Sister Muriel, and my things, put them in the trunk of the car and came out here to Richfield, to Mount Augustine. And I entered the congregation. Sister Muriel was right with me. She was a model for me of living religious life, being at peace with living religious life. And at the end, uh, really understanding God was calling her home. So I owe a lot to her. I owe a lot to her. Our constitution says, without a doubt that our charism, love of God, in all things charity, that really compels us to be of service to people. It is, you know, the greatest commandment, love God and then your neighbor. That is really what we're about and what charity means for us. It means that in all things we're doing, it's about our love of God and our ability to continue in a very visible way by how we serve people showing that love of our community and each one of us, each one of us, to really love God and have that manifested in all that we do. What does ministry mean to us? It means responding to the people that we serve, responding to the people that we serve. And it takes on so much, so many different forms in how we have responded, how our religious life is lived, how we care for people, what has happened in healthcare, if you look at the history of how healthcare was provided, for those who, you know, the rich, it was provided in their homes. For those who did not, may not have had access to healthcare, it was founded in hospitals. And when I look at our foundations, and all they're about is responding to the needs of the people that we serve and the communities that we serve. And wasn't it wonderful that we were able to do that and be about systemic change? We can't do it all but we're doing you know, what God has called us to do. And we're doing it in collaboration with others. And collaboration is an important, very important uh, value that we have. You know, one of our sisters, Sister Mary Patricia Barrett said, you know, we've never done it alone. And we have never done it alone. We have never done it alone. You look at the readings of Vatican II, uh, which was a major, major, uh, event in the Catholic Church. 
and Vatican II called upon the giftedness of the laity to be about church, to be about giving life to the church. And I know uh, when we did uh, first added lay people to our boards, and when we first developed the public juridic person, which was lay people joining the sisters, the highest level in governance of the, of the ministries, that people said, oh, we don't have enough nuns. We don't have enough nuns. Yes, our numbers are diminished, no question. No question about that. But the lay people really take their rightful place with us. Partner to partner, people that love God in their life, no matter what their faith dimension is, but love God in their life, and really come, come and dedicate themselves to the mission of who we are and God's love for us. So we have just wonderful people that have been right with us and really caring for God's people and really uh, taking risks. We talk about risks. They've taken a lot of risks. And you know, what, what is compelling is sometimes decision-making that we make may not be the most profitable because we reflect also on the mission. This is fulfill our mission. And we may have to step back and take some risk, but inappropriately, our business acumen moves us to manage the risk so that we could serve God's people. Our call for ministry is really about serving a person in need. That that's most important. That whether it's, and it's a holistic approach to it, whether it's someone spiritually suffering, someone that has needs physically, whether someone has emotional needs, that's important, social needs. It's responding to the needs of the people that God brings into our life. And that's been our history. That has truly been our history of the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine. Our archives really tells the story of our legacy, tells the story of the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine. Sister Mary Dennis is a certified archivist. She's trained to be an archivist. She also happens to have a PhD in English and taught at Ursuline College. Photographs, printed documentation, diagrams, newspaper clippings related to any of the institutions that our sisters worked at or have worked at in the past. Your memory is an important thing. You lose your memory and you lose your whole self. So, I mean, when you think about people who have serious Alzheimer's or things like that, that loss of memory is really a very devastating thing. And so the, you know, the preserve the memory of you and your family and your grandparents and your, you know, came over on the boat or something like that. You know, I mean, there's, are there stories that are in people's family? Well, we're a family like other families and those things are, you know, you're, you remember those things and think, boy, I better shape up and, you know, do the right thing here. I mean, that was always part of a young sister's training. I can remember uh, it was Sister DeSales uh, in my day, and she would cry as she told the stories about some of the sisters and what they did, you know. I mean, it became a joke, quote, among the young nuns, but I mean, it really, when you look back on it, it wasn't because she knew the people personally this is the spirit of the community. There's all these facts and figures and buildings, but it's really the people. Uh, and uh, the sense of trying to stay in that same spirit of supporting needs. You know, the old saying of St. Augustine there, in essential things unity, in doubtful things liberty, but in all things charity. So it's a sense of 
you know, having the ability to discern what's needed and then, you know, get up and get off your duff and get going and doing something about it. This is Sister Stanislaus, who was the first community historian. And uh, there are newspaper clippings um, also that are added in here. You know, she was there from the beginning. And uh, then the fact that it's handwritten, too. And we did have other sister archivists, so to speak, or historians more over the years. But that telling and retelling of the history, you know, it's a sense of keeping the purpose and the values alive there and realizing we're just a few people in the long line. The first Bishop of Cleveland was Amadeus Rapp, who came from boulogne sur France. His goal then was that he wanted a hospital and he wanted schools. So he went back home to his native France and he brought the beginnings of our sisters. If it hadn't been for him, you know, we would not have been able to start the things that we did, the ministries, uh, because he was generous financially. We were founded in response to an invitation by the first Bishop of Cleveland to come to Cleveland, Ohio. And he was the first Bishop of Cleveland, so you can understand in 1851 how things were, were, you know, we were coming as pioneers, really, and how the people were all pioneers at the time. But he brought the Ursuline Sisters of Cleveland to come in 1850 to uh, begin Catholic education. And we came the next year, all from the same town in France, where Bishop Amadeus Rapp had been in ministry, his priesthood. Well, he just went back to his hometown and said, okay, young ladies, <laughs> come with me to the new world. They thought they were coming to this country to convert the Indians. I always <laughs> say that uh, they didn't know what, what they were getting into. This is the boat that the nuns sailed in from France. If you think about sailing across the Atlantic in that boat, wasn't exactly the Queen Mary. They landed in New York and then uh, took a train to Cleveland. The forerunners of our sisters were called Augustinians, primarily because they followed the rule of St. Augustine, which is a printed letter that Augustine wrote to some women on how to serve God, country and mankind and so forth. The sisters, because they knew not only were they coming to start, uh, you know, this hospital, um, they knew that they would have a chapel with the hospital, and so they brought with them actually all these items on the bottom shelf here. But they brought um, a sanctuary lamp, they brought the candlesticks, the chalices, the other church items. And they also brought, because they were going to have a hospital and would have sick patients, they brought bolts of fabric for bandages and for sheets and things like that. Now, in those days, uh, if you brought full bolts of fabric, well, you paid duty on it. 
However, the wily nuns, um, they cut the bolts of material into individual pieces of fabric and wrapped those items in it so they didn't pay duty on the thing, which I think was very clever and businesslike of them. Well, there were four women that came. Two were professed. They were they made their vows and they were kind of uh, veterans <laughs> being religious. And one was the superior of the hospital, St. Louis Hospital, and another professed sister. But the other two were in formation. They were learning how to be a sister. And uh, they came with the four of them uh, came by boat to uh, the United States. And uh, the bishop didn't have a house for them when they got, finally got to Cleveland in October. So that was a huge risk. It was a huge risk. And immediately our sisters started providing uh, health care to people in their homes. You know, first public health nurses in the city of Cleveland. We did that immediately in 1851. The t t two young women, yes, were young and they, but they stayed in America. They didn't. The French ones went back, but you know, after you've seen Gay Perry, why would you stay in Cleveland, Ohio, if you had a chance to go back? They did whatever it took to be able to sustain a mission that they were doing, a ministry that they were doing to people in need. And the environment was so harsh for the uh, two professed sisters. They had very significant difficulty with the language, very significant difficulty with everything about this pioneer country. They were pioneers in this country when you think about it. So they asked, they petitioned to come back, go back home to boulogne sur mer And of course the bishop didn't want to hear that, but in 1852, they went back home to boulogne sur mer Our sisters did stay with those Ursuline sisters who were already here. And then over time, people joined them. So, and the first two became Mother Augustine, that was her name, and she was the superior of Charity Hospital. And then Mother Joseph was, um, took care of the orphans, was, had an orphanage. Well, she, as a young woman, had helped out Bishop Rapp when he was doing his going around from farmhouse to farmhouse, then joined up with the Ursulines. That was Ursula Bissonette from the Sandusky Way. On the afternoon of her making her vows, he said, you're going to come over to the west side of Cleveland here and uh, help to start this. Because she, she said always, because she wanted to be a sister of charity. That statue in the corner, Bishop Rapp gave to the sisters. It's a wooden statue, and notice over the steps of that building, which was St. Vincent's Orphanage, uh, there's a statue, and that's the statue. Not only did they have a little school, but also then you need to have some sort of a skill, uh, and carpentry was one of them, and they would take those pieces, the bookcases and what have you, and over to the West Side Market and sold those things. The desk, well, that was Mother Ursula's desk. That was obviously saved over time and handed down from one superior to the other. The bishop, actually, of the time, uh, is the one that gave the motto 
to the sisters in all things charity. You see two fleur de lis, and that represents the French background. And then that crescent is kind of like the new world. And St. Augustine is always pictured as a saint holding a heart that has been pierced as a sign of, you know, great love, great charity. You, you just give it out to everyone. As you can see, it is old and the ink is quite faded in there. But one thing, it seems like several of the early sisters were quite intent upon wanting to capture the history and you know keep a record of what they did and who helped support them. And Sister Stanislaus' history is one that one of the early sisters started to write. And some of those other books are interesting because they give the cost of things at the time and who gave the money to help them out. This one is interesting, 1926, but it lists the sisters who were 70 years and older at the time. Not the very first founding sisters, but these were others, ones that came early on. At your final profession, you, you had your picture taken, I mean, um, uh, by a photographer, you know, not just a little old brownie, but a real photographer. And you can see here, so this is, uh, very valuable because when people ask about sister so-and-so or whatever, who was their great aunt or whatever, then, you know, you can always, uh, the pictures are kind of interesting to look at, so. These are the, you know, from the early days, but it is amazing how many times you do get these calls from people and then then they want to know, you know, are there any pictures of where they were, like they worked at Parmadale, and a picture from there with the kids or something like that. Mm -hmm. There was a gentleman down in Columbia, South Carolina, Columbia, the capital, and his wife were out in California she got sick and was taken to a hospital out there and it was a Catholic hospital and she got this excellent care and so forth. He came back to Columbia and said to some of the hierarchy there, you know, we should have a hospital, Catholic hospital in Columbia now. Question was, where are we gonna, you know, we want a Catholic hospital, we're gonna get some nuns to do it. They came to the Sisters of Charity and proposed this idea of a hospital down there. And of course, in those days, going to South Carolina was like, from Cleveland, was like, you know, going to Africa or something like that. But they did get a number of sisters who volunteered. Early on, the first sisters there were volunteers. As the community grew, Obviously, there was a need to have a bigger place. This picture here, when you see what looks like the House of Seven Gables, so to speak, in the back there, that red brick with the spires, that was the first mother house that was built and removed from Monroe Street uh, to Lakewood there. The bell that's in the tower there of that Lakewood mother house is the bell that is out in the front yard. When you were a young nun and you were the bell ringer, which meant you had to get everybody up and awake at 6.30 in the morning, which you did, and got everybody up. 
and there's a picture here of the, the side of what it looked like. And one of the nicest things, since that was really right on Lakewood, it was, the property was next to Lakewood Park. And so you had all those nice breezes coming off the lake. And so this chair uh, is an example of the porch chair that you do see depicted in there. Yeah, so it was nice to sit on the porch and have the breezes off the lake biting everything. This bell in the corner, the, the times for mass and prayer and other religious services or other activities, um, in those days there was a bell that was rung and it sat actually at the bottom of the staircase inside there. And when it was time for prayers or a meeting or something, that bell was rung. <laughs> but even that mother house in Lakewood began to have some uh, difficulties and the Lakewood Fire Department felt there was not enough, you know, exits and that sort of thing. So that in case of some sort of a fire or something, it, so they began, the community then began to look for other property or a place to build. One day, uh, one of the men who was our driver was driving and saw this big farm for sale, the Newton Farm. And at that time, we had the hospitals in Cleveland, Charity and St. John's and St. Anne's. And we also had <clears throat> uh, St. Thomas Hospital in Akron and Mercy Hospital in Canton, the property is kind of midway between all those places and so it would be very handy. They did the Catholic superstition thing of burying a statue of St. Joseph. That statue that is in the case down there was buried um, in Catholic superstition or not. I guess it worked because here we are on this property. In this cabinet, there are artifacts from other of our institutions. Um, Mercy Hospital in Canton. There's a, a cap, a nursing cap, because we had several schools of nursing. Usually it was a nursing school connected with a hospital. Charity had a school of nursing. St. John's had a school of nursing. And uh, Mercy Hospital had a school of nursing. And so there are the nursing caps and pins. Well, I think that's been part of the community from the beginning that, I mean, when you come down to it, they came from France because there was a need here in Cleveland. Risk-taking obviously encouraged is one of our core values of we as a congregation, Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine. And from the very beginning, when our sisters were invited to begin Catholic health care in the Diocese of Cleveland, the Young Diocese of Cleveland, that was certainly a risk. And then moving into starting a hospital, needs of orphans become more prevalent. Those are all signs of risk-taking. You know, we could look at um, Sister Ignatia 
and working with Dr. Bob and Bill W. in really assisting the alcoholics, the suffering alcoholic, and being able to uh, serve and begin AA. Then we can look at uh, Sister Henrietta Gorris, who went into, in the midst of the uh, Huff riots in the city of Cleveland, went into uh, the Huff area and began helping people really uh, help them take care of their homes, provide nutritious meals for their families. All of that is risk taking. You know, and each one of our sisters, living or deceased, no matter what they did in ministry, there always was taking risks. And uh, we founded our, our health system and our foundations were part of that in 1996 when we were focused on systemic change and went to each of the communities that we serve, Cleveland, Canton, and South Carolina, and said, what are your needs? And then in a, in a process of systemic grant making, partnered with others. And some were risky ventures of partnerships that we had to walk away from at certain points. But to invest in really meeting the needs of the community that we serve specific needs that were critical for the people. I'm so grateful that all of you have responded yes. Yes to becoming part of this precious community that is a community of service to God's people. How precious your service is to us. We've never done it alone. And this is a critical time to say that to you. We need you. We need you. We need you to embrace this wonderful mission, this wonderful ministry, and to bring your creative ideas. You know what? You're gonna be part of new stories to be told. They're gonna to be wonderful new stories with courage, they're gonna be heroic. And some of the stories that we tell are of new ways of serving the homeless, new ways of being able to uh, care for children and making sure that children are the healthiest they can be, care for the elderly, all the things that we do, and care for those who are physically uh, in need of healing. All that we're doing, our dedication to healing, you're gonna have new stories to tell, and we're gonna be so proud, so proud. How could we not be?